starting next week, we are going to begin an adventure. We're going to begin a journey through one of my favorite books of the Bible. And I know, you say every book is your favorite, and there's, there's some truth to that. I do say that a lot. Um, but my new favorite, if I can say that, is going to be my book of Romans. We've spent about six to eight months, you remember a few years ago, going through the book of Acts, and I tell people all the time, it was my favorite sermon series that we have gone through, and sound, we're going to spend another good chunk of time going in depth through this amazing book, the book that Paul wrote to the church there in the city of Rome. Next week, we're going to begin a series on the book of Romans. I hope you can join us, uh, schedule now your Put your schedule on your schedule, whatever you got to do, uh, to make sure you can join us every Sunday at 11 o'clock. Uh, of course, your Sunday school as well. But every Sunday at 11, we're going to be going through the book of Romans. Um, so hopefully you are excited about that as much as I am. And I've heard if you want to start an argument, all you have to do is talk about either politics or religion. And so this morning, we're going to do everything we can to talk about both of them. This morning we're going to talk about the presidential election taking place in nine days from today is the election. And I'm, I do not stand up here to endorse any person. I do not stand up here to endorse any Republican, Democrat, Independent. I stand up here to endorse the holy words of God and his standard that he has given us. And I believe right there in our Bible that love letter that he wrote us, there's all the answers you and I need to choose a leader, to choose who you and I are going to vote for. I'd like to share a story with you. There's a story about a um, stretch limousine. This limousine was full of politicians. And they were driving down an old country road late at night. And it started to rain. And it got worse and worse and worse. A bad storm. And all of a sudden, the limo driver lost control. High speed, it flipped and flipped, and it ended up face down in a farmer's yard right next to his tractor. Well, things, kept, things were not well for the people inside, and the next day, the deputy goes by, and the deputy sees the limo, and goes up to the farmer, and he's like, was this the limo I heard about on the news that I was looking for? He's like, yeah, that's it. And so he's like, well, where are all the people? He's like, well, I buried them. He's like, buried them? Where, how'd you know they were dead? He's like, well, you know, so, some of them said they weren't. But you know how politicians are. You can't really believe them. So I buried them all anyway. We as Christians, which by the way, that means just the song, we have been purchased of God. Think about that for a moment, that you as a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, you've been purchased of God. You may look and be like, I'm not, <laughs> who would buy me? Uh, Jesus Christ is the one who would buy you. Back to, sorry, that's a rabbit trail there. Um, we have an opportunity, a great, unique opportunity as Christians. We live in the country where we have the right, the privilege to vote for our leaders. One of the founding principles of this great nation is not only the freedom of religion, but the freedom to vote and so we watch debates if you can handle them you watch debates you see commercial after commercial and what do they tell us they go to church every sunday right they have their i love jesus shirts on right there right they're going to tell us and try to tell us and push on us that they're holy they're the greatest people in the world before the election right now after the election something changes at least that's my opinion but i think something changes so as the election day draws near, I want to encourage us this morning. I want to challenge each one of us to keep the proper focus. Don't put your hope in a candidate. Don't put your hope in a person. Never forget, no matter who wins, no matter who is elected, no matter who wins this election, as a Christian, we are a child of the true king. Amen. To use one of our candidate slogans, the only way to make America great again, to use that phrase, the only way that's going to happen isn't by promoting world peace. It isn't by building a wall around the border. It isn't by fixing the economy. The only way to make America again, great again is to make Jesus Christ the leader of the country. The only way to make America great again is to turn for us to turn back to God. And we need to. We must vote godly principles. Listen to what Jesus says in John 8. 31 and 32, it's a passage that constantly gets twisted, taken out of context. 
Jesus says, says, if you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We've all heard that before, right? We are called to hold to the teaching that, what does that say, that God has given us. So we see in the Bible, we go through page after page, the teaching God has given us, but then we have been to look up, right? We look up and we look around. We look out of our Bibles and we look around and we see the trouble surrounding us today. One of them is the debt, the horrible debt that our country is in. You may think you're in debt today, but you don't understand how much debt we're in. You know, you, you may say that, but you don't compare, compare to the $20 trillion of debt that our country has. We have political problems. We have a two-party system that, if you ask me, does nothing but divide our country. We have social problems, violence, riots, suicide, depression, and on and on fill our country. We have moral issues, whether it's marriage, gender, abortion, sexual issues, and beyond. These go. We even have international problems. ISIS continues to threaten, and then they act on their threats, killing innocent lives, creating terrorism all over our world. In our country today, there's growing frustration in America. We're frustrated about the economy. We're frustrated because us as Christians, our religious freedoms are being attacked. People are stressed out. We're paying higher and higher taxes, health care, and the list goes on and on. There's nothing wrong, of course, with sharing your frustration, voicing your frustration. We should have actually the desire to make a difference, but we must maintain correct purpose, must maintain proper focus. We need to always remember, this isn't our temporary, or this isn't our permanent home. This is a temporary home for us as Christians. We put our trust, we don't put it in this candidate, that candidate, that candidate, we put it in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone is our only hope. He alone can save us. He alone can deliver us. And so we get excited. We're all excited as we leave this place. Excited about the things of God. And in a moment notice, in a blink of an eye, we're quick to switch gears and think all of a sudden that that new president is going to solve all my problems. The majority in Congress, that'll solve all our problems, right? I don't understand. I, I, I personally can't understand why so many Christians... We see what's in the word, his word, but then we compromise. We compromise the words in the Bible by voting for people who literally contradict what we see in our Bible. We complain about abortion. We complain about gay marriage. We complain about the legalization of drugs, prayer, being taken out of schools, and whatever it is that we complain about, other social topics. But then the sad fact is, Some of these things are happening because the people that we've elected are making those decisions. For decades, we've walked in, walked out of voting booths, voting for candidates who are directly opposed to things we stand for this morning. Why do we compromise? Was it because we thought the benefit of that person being in office would help the economy, so we compromised because of that? Do we compromise because we thought that candidate would create more jobs or initiate a tax reform? Or we don't want to lose our social security check, so we'll compromise because our check will be greater with that person than that person. Or maybe a candidate, that, that candidate said, I'll end the war. So, okay, even though all these things I disagree with because of this one, I'll go for that person. We have so many issues that need to be addressed, of course, in our country. But we must realize that our hope isn't in any of these people. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. We must constantly remember that is where our hope lies. So instead of praying, instead of trusting that the government is going to turn things around, we as Christians need to come to the conclusion we have turned from God. We have turned from God, and once we realize that and do our best to turn around, that's when things will get better, when we turn back to Christ. We have the opportunity to cast a vote for the person who we feel would be best suited to lead our nation for the next four, maybe eight years. 
And there's in your bulletin, there's actually a sheet that breaks down some of the issues. You'll see one candidate is for pro-life. One candidate is pro-life. One candidate is for abortion. Think about how many innocent lives the next four years could be lost based on our vote. One candidate is for strengthening our military, making sure our borders are protected. One candidate wants to raise taxes. The other wants to lower taxes. One wants to crack down on gun laws. The other wants to get rid of, rid of Obamacare. Take some time. I encourage you, take some time to see where each candidate sits on this issue, that issue, all the issues, and then compare them to your Christian values, principles. And do you know it's very possible that there could be consequences to the choice of our country. Our next president faces a reality of a few countries, Iran, South Korea, that have nuclear weapons. Our country will have to face that. Our president will have to face that. They'll have to deal with ISIS and all these acts of terrorism. They'll have to make decisions regarding the economy. Influ they'll have big influence on all these social issues I just talked about. They'll have an impact on our religious rights. And then one thing our president, new president will do that we forget is the president that's elected will be able to choose several, two, I think the four, something like that, new members to sit on the Supreme Court. They don't sit for just four years, do they? So long after this president that we're about to elect is gone, those people are still going to be making decisions for the future of our country. So as messy, and you may think ridiculous if you want to use that word, as this election and all of the glamour, if you want to use that word, that this election has been, it is vitally important. And just in case, let me explain this, just in case you don't think your vote matters, the last election four years ago was determined by five million votes. You know there's 25 million Christian registered voters who did not vote four years ago. Just let that sink in. So what happened, the president, that's our President Obama, was re-elected. And President Obama was re-elected, and he is the one who chose Sonia Sotomayor, I hope I'm saying that right, to be on the Supreme Court. And did you know that it was her vote that clinched same-sex marriage being now a law of the land? It was her vote that decided it. So do not, he can't sit here today. We can't stand here today and say, my vote does not matter. Your vote matters. Some Christians will say, well, I don't care about the character. I don't care about their character as long as they can win. I don't care about their morals as long as they can get us out of this recession. I don't care about their ethics as long as they can keep us safe. And the, if you ask me, that's the mindset that got us where we are today. People will argue that, that somebody's personal life and their political leadership don't matter, right? We've all heard that before. I would argue that. I would say that your personal life greatly affects every decision you make. And the decisions the president will make will affect our country. So I beg you, please vote your Christian principles. The truth of the matter is that real lasting solutions, they're not going to come from any man, any woman we put in the White House. The only real, the only lasting solution are going to come from Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the only way. He's the only truth and he is the only life. Every four years, Americans, we go to the polls to elect our nation's leader. Every four years, a candidate will emerge all sorts of ideas, policies, programs. And if you ask me, all these are promises. They all throw promises at us. Saying things like, we'll eliminate the debt. We'll secure the border. We'll boost the economy. We'll fix education. And on and on it goes. So we collect the facts, and then we go and make a decision. Left or right? 
liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican. We reach the articles, we watch the news, we listen to the debates, we follow the campaigns. We pick a, campaign, pick a candidate, and then we go and place our votes. But what happened if sometime this year was different? What if all Christians all over the world would say, I'm not just going to listen to promises, I'm going to be the promise. What if we promise to be the light of the world that the Bible tells us to be? What if we promise to be the salt of the earth, the hope of the nation? What if we promise to love our neighbor, forgive our enemies, pray for those who are around us, those people we can't stand, start praying for them? What if we promise to feed the hungry, care for the sick, help the poor? What if we kept our promises that we see in the Bible? What if we kept those? We, of course, bash the candidates for not keeping the promises. I just made a joke about it a minute ago. But do we keep ours as Christians? We must vote biblical values. We must vote biblical principles. And we need to understand not to get distracted. Because no matter who wins, as I said a moment ago, no matter who wins, they're human, right? Because only Jesus holds the real solution. And only the church, only you and I have been commissioned, only we have been called to live out this truth of God in this dark world. You know, there's really no need for us to cry out for a king because we already have a king, don't we? His name's Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and our hope is only found in him. He's the answer for America. It's not him, it's not hers, not any of them. The answer for America is Jesus Christ. Christ, amen? amen? America will be constantly spit in the face of God, I think, and then ask him to bless us. We've legalized immorality. We have normalized wickedness. We have what God calls an abomination is now legal. Every state. We've kicked God out of our schools, our government, our homes, and sometimes our churches. We blatantly spit in the face of of God. And then what do we sing in the World Series? What do we sing all the time? God bless America, right? Everybody's got a big smile on their face. Every disaster that shows up, every calamity we face, hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, floods, social issues, and all these problems, we run to God. God, please, where have you been? Why are you doing this? Well, what did he do to Israel? 1 Samuel 8, 18. Says, then you shall cry out in the day because of your king, which ye have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. If God did, did that to Israel, why couldn't he do that to us? Our hope is not going to be found in any Democrat. Our hope is not going to be found in any Republican. Our hope is not going to be found in any independent, conservative, liberal, or hope will only be found, I, I know it sounds like a broken record, but we need it to sit, it, sink in, your hope is only found in Jesus Christ. We must look to God for direction. He tells us in Second Chronicles seven fourteen, a very popular verse. It says, if my people, that's you and I, my people which are called by my name, you've been called by God, by the way, it says, should humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. That is the sermon in a nutshell. If we will just turn from our wicked ways and turn to the only one who can save us, that we just sung about, Jesus Christ, that's what we need to do. That's what tells us exactly what to do. We must do our part. We must humble ourselves, fall down on our knees in front of God. Say, God, it's all you, it's not us. I pray, as I close this morning, I pray that you will vote. It's so important. I have family members, they've already told me. I have family members in other states who said, I, I'm not going to vote. I don't like either candidate, so I'm not going to vote. And I'm sure you've had people tell you the same thing. I just think it's dead wrong. That's just my opinion. I, should, I don't know if I should say that from the pulpit, but I think that's dead wrong. We are called to vote. You have an opportunity to vote, and we are to vote, as the Bible says, our godly principles. So once again, I leave you with a challenge that we are called to vote. I hope you do here in nine days. But also, never forget that no matter who wins, no matter what happens, our king is right here, isn't he? Our true king 
has always been and will always be the king of all kings, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this day to talk about, for some, would be a tough topic, a sticky topic, Father. But we also come to you realizing that for us here, it is not. We are called to stand on your guidelines, your principles, your foundations that you have given us. And I pray that you will give each person in this room the confidence, the boldness to vote your standards. Father, our our nation is in trouble. We are hurting. There are people in this room who are hurting mightily, Father. If we would walk out these doors, it would not take long for us to find people who are in dire need, who are suffering. Whether it's physical, emotional, relational, it doesn't matter, Father. They're hurting people all around us. We desperately, desperately, God, need you to intervene, to step in. God, you are our hero, the only true hero, Father. And so we pray. We pray for this upcoming election. We pray that you will use us as a church. And even though some people here may say, what's what's the big deal? All I'm doing is filling in a few bubbles, pulling a few levers, Father. It is still an act of worship to follow you, Father. I pray somewhere in these ramblings that you have stirred hearts, God. And now as we go into this time of invitation, I pray that your will will be done. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.